right. I'd like to introduce Christine Madden. She's a technical officer with ICAO in Montreal, Canada, representing the uh, United States, and she's employed by the FAA. Uh, following a very diversified career in the private sector of the aviation industry. And her current role leads, uh, she leads the True North Advisory Group, a group of global experts attempting to determine if there should be a transition to using True North instead of Magnetic North for variation. Now, now a lot of people are probably panicking, thinking, what's that going to do? But I think in the end, we're, we're all kind of just using GPS anyway. We also have Anthony... Uh, McKay, who is the Vice President and Chief Safety and Quality Officer at NAV Canada, as well as the Chair of the Civil Air Navigation Services Organization, CANSO, Safety Standing Committee, Steering Group, and a Chair of the International Association of Institutes of Navigation, True North Working Group. He was an airline captain, flight inspection pilot, uh, avionics flight test pilot, check pilot, chief pilot, and uh, chief flight technical pilot for JAZZ, for Air Canada's JAZZ. And so he's got a Quite a colorful background. Both of these people are doing a lot for aviation and, and navigation. Hey guys, how you doing? Very good, Brian. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us here tonight. So I'm just going to give everybody a bit of a background first on um, the whole True North problem, what it is, and then Christine's going to go into where uh, we are with ICAO right now. So just going to share the screen and make sure we get the right one up. So. Just advance the uh, slides here. So um, as, as Brian's been talking about here tonight, so the issue is, well, which way actually is north? Um, and the, the frustrating part of this is everything we do in modern aircraft, air traffic control, IFR procedure design, everything we do in our systems, even with what, what Brian was talking about tonight, if, if you still dig out your sectional chart and you draw a line on it um, with a ruler, you measure those initial bearings in true. You start in true. So we, we build our maps, we do our nav, we do everything in air traffic, we do that all on true, but then we convert it into mag just because that's what we've always done. And then the problem is, as Brian showed you there with those VORs, is not all of those translations are matched. Not all of them are the same. So if you've got something from 1970 and something from 1995, that can cause issues. Well, the same thing happens in aircraft and even in modern aircraft. So everything from a regional jet to a 777, there's a couple of different MAGVAR tables within those aircraft. And even, even within your Garmin, there's a single nav one there, but if you have a different system on your airplane, it uh, could be something again. So as, as air navigation service providers, as us at NAVCAN and the FAA, we spend a lot of money to manage MAGVAR and whether that's up, updating approaches or sectionals or charts um, and, and then how aircraft deal with them. We've got a lot of working groups on, on how to keep track of this. So, you know, the real question should be is why do we keep converting this? Why do we stay in the mag reference and why don't we switch to true? So as I've been talking, the two maps on the side, they've been running, just showing how much magnetic north has moved and it is picking up speed. And the magnosphere is actually weakening over time. So if you talk to the scientists, they'll tell you that we're really, really, really overdue for a magnetic pole reversal, but even if something like that happened, it's not something that happens in a day or a week. Um, in geological time, it's quick. Um, in human time, it, it's still a long time, but it's still gonna cause uh, problems for us as it changes. So this image here, this is where I really um, kind of picked up on it was in the low vis world. So, you know, we spend uh, a lot of time and money as an air navigation service provider, making sure our ILSs, VORs and NDBs are all lined up. So in Canada, our tolerances are plus or minus two degrees. So as soon as magnetic north moves more than two degrees from where we'd set the, the declination of the navigation facility, we have to go out and rotate the VOR and then update all of our charts to maintain it within two degrees. For category two and category three ILSs, we have to maintain it within plus or minus one degree. Everything else pretty much runs on plus or minus two. But as you can see from this image, this is a head up guidance system that's pulling the magnetic variation for the heading out of the uh, inertial database. And there's a difference between what we publish as an air navigation service provider and what is in the real outside world. So the synthetic runway doesn't line up with the real runway. Now, if you're flying something with a HUD, you can correct for that manually. 
Um, but still, it's a bit of a surprise as you come out the bottom of a Category 3 approach at, at 50 foot minimums in the fog. But we've also had issues with Autoland airplanes as they go into autonomous flare mode and pulling to the left or the right to correct for an apparent wind that actually isn't there. So not all the tables hold the same value. And then this is what happens when they actually don't match up. Um, you'll see this in every kind of flight management system from Honeywell to Collins, Universal, Garmin, whoever. But because different segments of approaches pull magnetic variation from different parts of the aircraft, this is supposed to be a straight line on this approach. But as you leave Hokpo and you cross over Joglu on this approach, the aircraft is going to roll to the right to intercept that course. And then the missed approach on this particular um, procedure is even worse. So low altitude, low energy, low speed, you go into a missed approach and the aircraft is going to take a pretty hard turn to the right to pick up the missed approach track um, as it goes. And, and again, that's just because the declination of the VOR is uh, not kept up to where things are in the real world. Because of the magnetic variation issues, you end up with airworthiness directives that come out against various aircraft, various systems, because the interesting fact is, while you have to go and align your um, magnetic compass, your wet compass, every year, every two years, depending on whether you're Canadian, European, or, or um, following FAA rules, there's actually no rules that say you have to maintain um, up-to-date magnetic variation tables in your inertial reference systems or your flight management systems. What there is, though, is for the avionics manufacturers, there's guidance that says you have to keep your customers aware of what the magnetic variation is doing to the aircraft. So this is for a, a regional jet, and there's an airworthiness directive that came out um, that limits Category 2, Category 3 operations at certain airports, and you can no longer use the flight management system to do holds um, in a good chunk of the uh, airspace that the, the aircraft actually operates in. Now, the irony of it is if you can confirm the track in true, then you can actually still use the flight management system um, to do holds. And then the same thing, even on larger aircraft, so uh, bulletins uh, for the left-hand side, Airbus uh, fleet 319s through to 321s, and then on the right-hand side, um, uh, 787. So 787 out of the factory goes to work and uh, oops, I can't fly. ILS is currently in the Keflavec uh, or Whitehorse Canada or Fairbanks or Anchorage um, because the mag tables are out of date. And you end up with a systems level arguing within the aircraft electronics between the localizer guidance and what the inertial is doing over top of that um, to correct for any roughness in the localizer. So it, you know, all these out of date Magvar tables actually end up causing problems. Uh, so you've seen this map um, and it, it started with NAV Canada and Transport Canada. And then we were working with the International Association of Institutes of Navigation to say, well, hey, is there a better way to do this? And then we started down the true path a number of years ago. But Canada's in, a, in an interesting place in that the yellow area that you see on the map, that has since the beginning of time been referenced to true. So all of our procedures, all of our bearings, all of our navigation aids, both conventional and uh, performance-based or GNS-based have always been referenced to true. And it works without any error. And a lot of those issues and errors that Brian was showing you earlier. Um, if you're operating something with an inertial, that purple area there, there is no magnetic table for that area. So it forces the aircraft into true um, whether or not you wanna be there. So then we did a little study to say, well, what about different aircraft types? Is, is it just the large jets that are going to handle true easily? So within a six-month period, we pulled all the flight plans. And all those green dots, those are all the airports uh, across the Arctic. And uh, on the left-hand side is all the aircraft types that have been there. So, you know, Dash 8s, ATR 42s, 43s, uh, military aircraft, uh, you know, Challengers, regional jets, and then Cessnas, helicopters, Metroliners, um, Navajos, everybody has systems um, that essentially now handle the, the true north with the push of a button. Just so people don't think this was something that, you know, a bunch of us sitting in a room came up with on our own, we did involve a, a complete cross-section of the industry, which would be, you know, 
Canada's representation of pretty much what you would see in, in uh, Europe or in the United States. So everything from the large airlines um, right down to the general aviation pilot, helicopter operations, whatever um, that happens to be. And the eye chart on the right is just all of the threads where magnetic variation goes um, within aircraft and systems. Something you can take a look at later, but this was just all the areas of study um, that went into this. And this is all information we've made available uh, to ICAO as well as we make this assessment. And then a couple of things we did was, well, how do we actually do this change? And there's a bunch of different ways to actually do it. Uh, an expensive way is to put inertials on every airplane. Um, a cheaper way is, is Garmin's actually got a great way to handle it as well as other manufacturers. And then we did actually a test where in our flight test RJ uh, in Southern Canada, we took all the magnetic variation values um, that were populated through the database and just made them zero. So magvar zero equals true. And the dirty little secret of magvar is, is it doesn't actually need to be right, although it should, um, but it all just really has to match. So as soon as you make it zero, you equal true and away you go. So, you know, here's an example of a modification. The flight check RJs uh, NAV Canada has are built in 2001. And the, the training for how to get into true is to push the display mode button and you switch from mag to true. And that's much the same on any transport category aircraft um, larger than that. Uh, the flight test uh, dash eight that we had, same thing. Uh, just push the mag true switch. And uh, now the entire aircraft is over in true and all those little magnetic variation anomalies that you have um, disappear. Airplane I've been flying lately, friend of mine's got a, a Grumman Cheetah built in 1972 with a Garmin 430 and uh, two button pushes, rotate the knob once, push the button again, and you flip that thing over from mag to true. However, um, there is a pilot procedure with this where you have to look at the magnetic compass to set the directional gyro. So did a really expensive mod on this one and took a post-it note and wrote minus 13 on it for 13 degrees west and looked at the compass, minus 13, set the directional gyro um, and away you go. So those RJs that we had for flight inspection were currently replacing them. And we looked across a bunch of different aircraft types and that same kind of functionality um, is available across many fleets and many different avionics platforms. Now, other aircraft, uh, Boeing, Airbus, um, it is a standard order option uh, generally that you can get to have that mag true switch in the airplane. And the lines that you see moving there on the map, those are the isag isagonal lines. And that's the last hundred years really since aviation began. And the green line in the center is the zero isagonal. And it's just interesting to see how much it's picked up speed lately. And if Europe decided to switch to true, now would be a good time to do it or else very shortly, they're gonna to have to renumber a bunch of runways and uh, realign a bunch of VORs. Bit of an eye chart here, but this is just database um, that constructs everything that's within your GNSS navigator. And this is where entering zero in different fields equates to true. I already talked about the test that we did. And we were actually surprised when we did the test by just swapping all those values to zero and everything that we looked at in the aircraft from flying conventional procedures to PVN procedures, a um, little more advanced stuff with RMPAR. And then for those of you that are flying LPV approaches, everything was successful from the electronic flight bag, the head up guidance system, um, enhanced ground proximity warning, no off nominal events were observed or any discrepancies across. Charting and true, depending on what part of the earth you're in. Um, in Africa, they're actually following the ICAO annexes and any RNAV procedures are supposed to have the true values and components published on the chart. Um, they're about the only place we found so far that actually does that. In Canada, we do it for that Northern domestic airspace, which is the chart on the left. And then we asked uh, Boeing Digital slash Jeppesen to mock up some charts for us for a transition. What would that look like? So the magnetic and the uh, true values on the plates. And then as you transition into that changeover period, if, if we decide to do it at some point in the future, um, the day before the change, you use the magnetic value and the day after the change, you would use the um, true value. So, you know, when you get your weather, all the winds that you get, those are reported in true. 
and you've got to convert all of that to mag with the exception of takeoff and landing, the wind that you get from the tower. And all of our automatic weather reporting systems, they all report the uh, wind and true. And then if it's broadcast directly out to the flight crew pilot, um, we convert that to mag before it goes out on the system. Did a bunch of work with insider air traffic uh, systems to see what that would look like. And uh, pretty low effort, especially in today's environment. And then I love this map. Um, this magenta area is everything that was then plus or minus 10 degrees. So if you figure your wet compass today only has to be swung to within plus or minus 10 degrees, for anybody operating aircraft within the magenta or the yellow area, really not a whole lot of impact for you. But if you're an airport um, and you're really worried about having your runway um, number match what true is, well, even within that, the AKO Annex is, you know, plus or minus 10 degrees. Uh, anything within yellow is plus or minus four. You really wouldn't have to change your runway numbering, plus or minus 10. You could kind of get around to it. Um, anything outside of that, though, uh, so Canada, United States, Brazil, um, Russia, South Africa, New Zealand, um, you know, we're the ones that are going to take the big hit. So just real quick to show how this has been thought about, we actually looked at uh, 25,700 airports worldwide. So here's the, here's the cool thing is out of all those airports um, by 2030, if you said by the letter of the law, you're going to change everything to true, 14,000 runways should change their numbers. Um, but between now and 2030, because of the way magnet, magnetic's moving anyway, 8,000 of those should change anyway. So if you change nothing, you still got to change 8,000. So add another six. And then actually 5,600 and change are actually out of alignment today. So it was just a bit of a neat study. Um, then we did the same thing with the VORs to see what the, the alignment, the declination was like on those. And that was a really quick trip through um, where we are. Um, give you a little bit of background on the whole magnetic versus true um, issue. And then our good friends over to ICAO ran a worldwide survey just to see what the appetite was like, because it's a big change and it's going to take time. And Christine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Anthony. So I'm going to go ahead and share the information as far as um, what we are doing in ICAO to move this forward or, you know, determine if we should move it forward. Let me say it that way. So um, we've shown this picture a few times, so I really just kind of want to hit hit the point here again that you see in uh, 1900 to the year of 2000, how Magnetic North was moving over that 100 year period. And then you look to the right side of the 2000 to, to projected 2025. So in 25 years, it how much it is moving. I saw someone ask a question or was making a, a, a comment about is magnetic north moving towards Siberia? And the answer is yes. And since the year of 2000, at a very fast pace compared to the years prior to that. So um, our goal here in ICAO is uh, we've established, first of all, the True North Advisory Group, um, which is a group of experts globally um, across many uh, uh, disciplines in aviation that will provide, um, will do many studies and develop a, a concept of operations or con ops and a transition plan, what would that look like and how do we move forward? Um, Anthony shared this, um, the colors got a little bit wonky because I overlaid the world magnetic map um, with our heat map of our respondents. So we went out and did a survey in uh, September to December of 2022. And um, here are the respondents globally. So on uh, six continents, um, obviously Antarctica being the seventh the continent, we don't have a population there. But anyways, of the remaining six continents, we had respondents to this survey. Um, was very well received. We got a lot of great information and part of our reason uh, here today is to share this information with you. And we also wanna hear from everybody here. What do you think? Um, definitely general aviation 
is in the mix of who we want to hear from. This slide here shows the overall support from that survey. So 61% of the survey respondents um, uh, support uh, either strongly or somewhat support this effort. 30% uh, were neutral. So as we move forward with our true advisor, uh, true North advisory group, we will look into why were they neutral? Maybe they're not affected uh, for, for various reasons. So we'll dig, dig deeper into that. And only 9% did not support it. So for today's purposes, I want to, uh, first of all, share with you the stakeholders that we uh, go across. CAA stands for Civil Aviation Authorities, and then the Air Navigation Service Providers, Airdromes, relates to the airports globally. Um, airport operators, which um, is, uh, unfortunately, I think, in, in the terms of general aviation, business aviation, and the airlines, is lumped into one, but you'll see here that we had really good support from the air operators, also a large area of neutral and a relatively small number of um, not supporting it. And then the manufacturers, the instrument flight procedure designers, and then others, others relates to um, training organizations, military, and a, a small group there. Oops. Um, so just to dive a little bit deeper into this uh, the distribution across the air operators, um, I think we're mostly talking to a general aviation um, audience today. So I want to point out that we had 33% of those air operators which fall into the general aviation category. And as far as the True North Advisory Group, we have uh, organizations such as Gamma and um, AOPA, AOPA, depending on where you live. We also have the IAOPA, so the International AOPA Organization. And then they have their um, state, um, their uh, groups that fall under them, that their constituents of their membership. So that would include uh, Garmin and general, first general aviation manufacturers. We have like Textron and uh, Alberta goes into the business jets, but um, you know, Diamond Aircraft, all, all so everybody was included in the survey is the point I'm trying to make. So through this survey questions, there was overall 65 questions, but the stakeholders only had to uh, uh, answer about 15 questions, not all 65. And then we had an area where they can also uh, free text and type in their concerns or uh, additional benefits. So in a snapshot here, um, benefits that were identified, simplified operations, reduced workload, improved accuracy, increased operational safety, and eliminate ongoing maintenance and updates. So for many of the reasons that Anthony's already described, we found uh, lots of benefits. Of course, there are challenges, and I will touch on those uh, momentarily. But then in the free text, we had uh, some of the top foreseen benefits by air operators. And um, the second one, you know, I think may be more towards the airline operators. But but number one and number two, I think we uh, can all relate to with the weather and charting products. Uh, products, how, how they start and true, and then we have to convert them and change things and figure out numbers. And fortunately, <laughs> fortunately today, you guys have uh, lots of electronic uh, devices such as um, for flight and applications. Uh, when I was learning how to fly, it was paper and I used the paper sectionals and we had to do all that manually. So anyways, uh, so here is a few of the challenges that were identified, and it's not to stop here, but this is to share with you what's been identified through the survey. The survey was a starting point, so now that we get this group together, we'll deep dive, we'll be reaching out to the community such as yours, and uh, in general aviation, as well as the other air operators, um, as I mentioned earlier, the airports, and everybody that has anything to do with um, who would be affected by this uh, is, is included in what we're looking for. 
And then just like on the benefit side, you know, in the free text area, we had uh, captured some of the top foreseen challenges by air operators. And um, some of this, you know, aircraft downtime uh, might, I know it applies to general aviation, but I think, I think more largely this might be uh, for the business jets and the uh, airline operators. So really a cool thing we did was um, we got to collect um, some key questions that the respondents identified for us. And so that's what this um, slide is sharing. What's the time frame? How do we do it? How do we do it globally and in a harmonized way? What does a transition look like? Um, what, what safety risks exists and how are we going to mitigate them as far as you know if we get to implementation and how do we do this globally would it be um a phased approach or do we just kind of flip a switch and go from you know tomorrow I, i'm not not literally tomorrow but anyways our study group will be studying this for three years so so that nothing will happen for the next three years but anyways if we as a group decide that yes, this is the better way of uh, of uh, navigating uh, through aviation and um, how, how do we do it? And then of course, I think most of you would be concerned here with the, um, how does it affect the general aviation and small aircraft operations? And then for the others, as far as uh, corporate and airliners, how does this affect the aircraft, uh, larger aircraft operations? And this is where we are today. Um, starting March 13th, we'll have our kickoff meeting with this true advisory group. Uh, like I said, they're experts from all over the world, from uh, many disciplines. And we'll be working on, uh, first of all, we'll be, I maybe have this a little bit uh, backwards, but what we will be conducting studies and analyses of different areas, technical, operational, safety, cost benefit analysis, and then uh, developing a concept of operations and how would we would implement and transition to this. And the thing we're doing today, engaging stakeholders, outreach and communication along the way is very important. Quick summary, uh, basically everything I just talked about here. And I um, will share this slide with Brian so he can send that out to all of you, but these are links. Uh, if you want to learn more, these are links. Some of them are kind of videos. Some of them are articles. Some of them, as you can see here, dates back to March 2011. Yeah, there's some fascinating stuff there. And I've got a lot of those links that you sent me already on that web page. It's at the, toward the bottom, just listed there. And uh, all the remainder will be on the website as well for anybody wanting to look deeper into that. I'm just concerned about when we find out that the earth is flat, what's that going to do? And what if the magnetic pole falls off the side? I mean, <laughs> that could be a problem. That could be a big problem. By the way, just a real quick, Brian, I, I did add, uh, I think, two or three more links since since we talked. So this is okay. the data version. But yeah. that is the conclusion of my presentation. So thank you again, Brian and Mike, for the time um, that you've given us to share this. I really Well, you bet. It's a very important topic. And I think it's worth getting people thinking about it, at least, because it's coming. Uh, and we're, we're seeing a lot of changes. It has a lot to do with our chartage, the electronics we use, and ForeFlight as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll simultaneously with a break that we take, if that's okay with you guys. And I know that Christine and Anthony are going to hang out if we have any questions for them.